Now, the great master Dogen came to China in the 13th century and brought back what became known as the Soto School. And I'm going to tell you the story of him going to China, but I'm going to finish this story first, because after he'd gone to China and come back and been there for a while and written some really good stuff and taught people how to meditate, he decided he had to go out in the middle of nowhere. Because the middle of nowhere was really the only place that people could settle down and do some real Zen work. Otherwise, they would be distracted by everyday life, by politics and by ego-reinforcing things, and, and just by stuff. And so he went into an extremely desolate area, but beautiful, and built a monastery up a canyon, basically. Built a monastery up a canyon on the side of a mountain. And one day the emperor, and Dogen was very young. If I remember right, he was 53 when he passed away. So he was very young. But after Dogen had been up there for a while, the emperor, uh, the local boss, whoever, decided that he needed some uh, honors. And so he sent Dogen a purple robe. The purple robe was given to usually old monks, enlightened monks in China, as a sign that they were recognized as a national teacher. In other words, the emperor recognized that their, their attainment. And so they would wear these purple robes normally on, on ceremony occasions, and they were considered national teachers. Jap- Japan has this policy now. And it started because they copied the Chinese with their Buddhism, and Dogen was sent one of these purple robes. And Dogen refused to accept it. And he was repeatedly sent a purple robe. And he repeatedly refused to accept it. Which is not a real good good deal. Because probably the guy sending the purple robe, I don't think it was the emperor, but the guy that was sending the purple robe was his number one financial supporter for the temple. Because historically, uh, temples have usually had <clears throat> a handful of of benefactors, wealthy people who could come up with the money to build a temple or do the big things, you know, not the everyday people. They don't have the money to build these big, beautiful temples. And so he was basically turning away this gift that if it didn't come directly from his benefactor, it certainly came from his influence to be a national teacher because he had to have permission from the central government. Okay, this robe did not come from a little guy, a governor of a province. It came from central government. One day, Dogen was gone in town. He got sick towards the end of his life. One day, he was gone in the town, and one of his students, and uh, he had a lot of devoted students, the emissary came with the purple robe, and the student accepted it. And when Dogen returned and found out that his student had accepted this purple robe for him, he immediately kicked the student out of the monastery. He had monks go into the meditation hall where the student slept and meditated and dig the earth six or eight feet deep underneath his seat and then put the robe in that hole and put the earth back on top of it. Dogen, when he left China, his master told him to stay out of cities and stay away from the court. Chinese Chan, Chinese Zen, had figured it out after a couple hundred years that they did not belong in the court. That getting in there and and eating the, the beautiful, delicious vegetarian feast and having these silk robes and having all the attention they would get and being able to do just about anything they needed to do And we're talking about good monks. If they needed to do something, they could simply go to the emperor and say, I need some money to do this. If they wanted to print sutras, the emperor, they just go, I need to print sutras. Uh, If they wanted to feed some hungry, they could do that. It was too easy. And so the Chinese Zen masters got themselves out of the city and into the hills. And so Dogen was told as he was going back, this foreigner from a far land was told, Stay out of the cities. Stay out of the court. Go out in the country to teach. 
which he eventually did. Dogen went to study with, and now there's argument, so I, I don't want to say it like scholars very often say, and this was the founder. There was a fellow by the name of Ace, and he is very often looked at as the founder of Renzai in Japan. <clears throat> because when we talk about Renzai and we talk about Soto, we have to talk Japan. Because after a very short amount of time, there is no Soto in China. The school, after a few hundred years, dies out. We start with seven schools, and we essentially get down to one. And then once we get down to the Renzai school, then we start talking about schools again, because then we have houses within the Renzai school, a powerful force, a powerful lineage line. In the 13th century, we have two monks who come to China, who make the pilgrimage to go to the source. To them, that was the source of Buddhism. Ese is a Tendai monk. He goes to China. He stays there a few years. He learns in meditation. He comes back to Japan, takes up residence in a Tendai temple again, and begins to teach Zen. There is a political problem in Japan. They are not taking any new schools. The number of schools is fixed. Buddhism has been in Japan now for 400 years, when Rinzai appears on its shores. They don't want any new schools. Tendai had meditation in the school. Tendai had a threefold practice, meditation, sutra study, and chanting. Uh, we had tantric Buddhism there that had been there for a long time. Uh, meditation and ceremonies. Great, elaborate, magical ceremonies coupled with ascetic practice and meditation. So meditation was not new to Japan. What was new to Japan was the idea that all the monks would do it all their life. In the other two schools, it was kind of like basic training. You went and you did this stuff. You learned how to meditate. You learned how to do these things. And then you were done with your training. And now you moved on and you functioned as a priest, primarily doing ceremonies and things like that. The public was not taught. It was very much a superstitious kind of laden thing. Shingon is a tantric school that my mind clears. The public would attend, much like a Catholic would attend Mass, they would be a little bit involved in it. They would get to see the wonder and the glory of the ceremony. They would uh, venerate uh, the, the historical Buddha and the monks performing the ceremony. But they did not actively involve themselves in the religion in the sense of having a practice. When Ese came by, back, he started involving all the monks in meditation, and a few lay people snuck in. But he couldn't start a Zen temple because you had to have permission of the government. And the government had all this infighting going on with these different sects of Buddhism that had been around for a long time, 400 years. And they didn't want any new schools. They didn't want to have to split up the pot. The government did help support the temples. There was a pot to be split up. And so they didn't want to do that. And so Eisei never had a Zen monastery in Japan. What he did is he lived at a Tendai monastery and he used the Zen techniques to teach his students. And they were all monks for all intents and purposes. Monks did come to him. They heard about him. Some monks who had decided that meditation was the way they wanted to go and they were kind of sort of starting their own thing would go and live with this master. <clears throat> Dogen was a Tendai monk. He became a monk at a very early age. His mom and dad had, were both dead by the time he was six or seven. He came from the Minamoto clan, very influential clan in the emperor's bloodline. This was no small shakes. This was a kid that by the time he became a monk, he could read and write. He was writing poetry. He was brilliant. He was sent to study with an uncle who shaved his head and became, made him a novice. He read the sutras. He got to a point in his practice where he, reading the Lotus Sutra, it talked about all of us being Buddha. And Dogen was thrown into a great doubt. If we're all Buddha, then why don't we act like it? If we're all enlightened, 
then why do we need to practice? Why do we need to study? And so Dogen started looking about, because at the, the study center that he was at, and he was at Mount Hie, which was like the place to be in Japan. And he started looking about for some teacher that could help him resolve this, because he was... He had, he, he had come face to face with impermanence by losing both his parents at a young age. Impermanence, this young boy of 12, 14 years old. I believe he was about 14 when he went off to start studying Zen. He was, a, you know, younger when he ordained. And who he came up with was Ese. Now, the argument begins. Most historians agree that by the time Dogen got there, Ese was dead. Okay? He was old. He had passed away. There is a dual tradition within the Soto school that is maintained with great fervor. One is, is that Dogen did go study with him, and then he passed away. The other is that he didn't. Now, you can see how it would be important if he did go study with him. Whoa, the two founders of the two schools in Japan knew each other. Wow, wouldn't that be neat? Eh, probably didn't happen. Most historians think it was apocryphal. But what we do know is Eisei had a Dharma heir. And the Dharma heir was a powerful teacher named Myozen. And Myozen was the teacher of Dogen. And in the school of Zen, if we spend too much time worrying about whether you studied with the primary teacher or the primary teacher's disciple, you miss the whole point. Dogen went and studied with Myozen. Myozen was a little bit older than him, but not a whole bunch. Eventually, they go to China. Every good monk had the in their mind that they wanted to go to China, to the source, to the place, to bring back true Buddhism. This had been a tradition forever. Shingon, Kyukai, 400 years before, had gone to China and brought back Shingon. He was there one year, and he received Dharma transmission. His teacher gave him a portrait of himself. He gave him all the tantric implements to conduct the ceremonies. He gave him the empowerment to do anything that a Shingon priest would have to do. And think of like a bishop. One year of study, he came back and started a school that still goes on in Japan. Okay? So this was a very old tradition. So Dogen and Myozen go to China. They get there, and Myozen is allowed to enter China, Sung China, and begin his pilgrimage. And, of course, he's going to look about the temples, visit some of the temples, uh, listen to the great teachers talk, maybe have interviews with them, really rub his face in the dust of Zen. He is at the place. Dogen is required to stay on the boat for some time. Nobody's really sure why. Dogen doesn't say directly why. He just says there was some kind of problem with his paperwork. While he was stuck on the boat, he had an encounter with a monk. And the monk left him with a great impression. He was an old and venerable monk who had come to the market to buy mushrooms and other things from Japan. The Japanese have these really great mushrooms, you know, put in soup. So Dogen meets this monk and gets to talking to him and asks him where he's from. And he talks about how he's from this great temple and there's a, you know, and they practice Zen and everything. And, and it starts getting dark and Dogen invites him to stay overnight on the boat with him and start back in the morning. Because the guy had walked quite a distance, and the monk said, no, I can't do that. And Dogen says, what do you mean you can't do that? And he says, well, I didn't ask permission to stay out overnight. And Dogen says, but you're an old and venerable monk. You know, and hierarchy is important in Buddhism. We, we respect the old and venerable monks as compared to the young and foolish monks. And he said, no, I, I didn't ask permission to stay out, so I have to go back tonight. But thank you for your offer. And if you're ever... Uh, up my way, stop in and say hi. So now Dogen gets off the boat and he starts going from temple to temple. And the first thing that happens, he relates to us in his diary, is that he gets discouraged because he, he expected, you know, kind of like heaven, right? Green grass over the hill. He expected things to just be so spectacular in, in China. And what he found was that 
if Japanese Buddhism had become institutionalized, Chinese Buddhism had really become institutionalized. Even the great monasteries on the peaks of the mountains where true meditation practice was supposed to take place had become institutionalized. And people were more concerned about uh, their day-to-day territorial squabbles than they were about realizing their true nature. <clears throat> Dogen was there approaching a year. And he had, in that year, Miozen died. He went and visited the temple where he had died. Uh, was really thinking about going home. Did a memorial service for him there, was ready to leave, and he got a letter from the monk, the old monk, the cook, the Tenzo, on the boat. Foreigner, please come and visit me before you leave. We have a new abbot, and he's of a different school, and he's a tough guy. You might like him. <laughs> 